Where's the <laughs> it is mule and donkey time, according yeah, to is. Jess, the Border Collie, oh, as well true. as the calendar and the clock. It is time to talk mules and donkeys with Mr. Steve Edwards. Steve, is that really you? Hey, if that's really you, raise your right hand. <laughs> Oh my goodness. It's really us. We're live after a couple weeks away. We're live and we're super excited to be hanging out with you here today. My name's Dave. This is Steve Edwards. And every Tuesday we get together at three o'clock Arizona time. So it shifts a little bit here or there for the rest of the country because this is the wild, wild west out here. We don't do no stinking daylight savings time or whatever. So uh, three o'clock Arizona time. And for the next 60 minutes, we're going to be your tour guides into the theme park of Mule and Donkey. Steve, tell me, how has it been? It's been two weeks since we talked. How's it been? Oh my goodness. I tell you what, anybody tell me I've been 18 hours in an airplane going and 10 hours in a car to get to the ranch in Buenos Aires. I just said, oh my goodness, but now I'm saying, oh my, oh my. <laughs> I tell you what, I thought, well, it's going to be good. For for eight to 10 hours, we're going to be in the car and I get to see Buenos Aires, wouldn't that, I mean, I mean, Argentina. And I'm thinking I'm going to see gauchos going across the, the plains, you know, the, of the Pampas and and cattle and everything. Only thing it looked like to me, Dave, and this is the truth, if you've ever been there, You'll know what I'm talking about, but Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, so all that flat country where you see nothing but corn and soybeans. That was all I saw for almost eight hours. Yeah. Of traveling in that vehicle. Oh my goodness. And they were not allowed to go over uh, 55 miles an hour in this little bus uh, because of their laws. Besides that, the roads were so bad. They had, because the economy is so bad in Argentina, they actually, you could see bridges and stuff where they started to, to build the freeways, but then stopped because they their economy tanked. And get this, the biggest bill that they could carry was a $2 bill. That was it. It's 350 pesos to our one. Yeah. So it was uh, it was quite the trip, Dave. Yep, the ranch was incredible. So what you're saying is you were a millionaire over there with all your pesos. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You hand them a dollar beer over there, they think they done gone to heaven, man. <laughs> Woo. I, I heard on a television show they were talking about um, Burlington Coat Factory. He goes, you might not be able to get a lot for $800, but you walk into Burlington, Burlington Coat Factory with $800, you are literally royalty. You can buy anything you want. <laughs> so wow. Steve was like royalty over there in Argentina. Hey, is that where we get the leather from, the Argentina leather? Yep. Yep. Sure is. Yeah. That's Well, that's for the one saddle. We, and we get a lot of our leather from there, but the one saddle in particular, the trail light. No, the trail, uh, the, the, the ultra heritage? light. Oh, the ultralight. Yeah, the ultralight. Okay. Light, that is that is imported uh, from Argentina, dyed and ready to go, and it's awesome leather. the The downside of buying leather here is it's not only about three or four times the price, but the government has smashed it so much with having uh, uh, all their rules that that made prices go tremendously high here. It's actually cheaper to buy it in Argentina and have it brought here. And just as good a leather, but not the high end price. But you know, man, wisdom, wisdom of God, or what is it? The wisdom of man is God's foolishness, something like that. Yeah. Hey, like uh, that. so uh, for the next sixty minutes, we're going to be chatting, and we want to hear from you. We want to hear uh, who's hanging out with us today. I already have a few folks who are chiming in, and I'm going to read your names in a second. But really, there's only three things we ask, and the first thing is that you let us know you're watching. Share your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather is like today. And uh, weather out here in Arizona, fantastic. It's awesome. We're loving it. And we're hoping that it lasts like this as much as possible. We got lots of rain this winter, which was great. We had some rain this spring, 
which was really, really great. And so we'll take it. But the weather's doing just fine out here. We want to hear the same from you, your name, where you're watching from, what the weather's like. The second thing is we want to hear all of your mule and donkey questions, whatever it is you're working through right now. If you have encountered something that you're not sure of, uh, something that seems a little bit peculiar to you, or maybe it seems a little off, or maybe it's just some behavior you really don't know what to do. You haven't encountered it before. We want to hear from you and uh, do our best to help you. If we don't know the answer, we'll tell you we don't know the answer, but uh, uh, chances are we've run into something similar, and so we'll tell you what worked for us or what might be worth giving a try. And then the third thing we ask is that you share the broadcast. That's real easy to do on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, you click the share button, you click the like button, the subscribe button, or comment. That's it. That's all you got to do to share with friends and family members. So I want to say hello to Sherman Johnson, Norman, Oklahoma, 75 and windy. Dave O'Brien is watching as he does from East Texas where it's 63 and very wet. Glad you had a great trip. Welcome home. Marsha says, I'd be saying there's no place like home. Took the words right out of his mouth. I'm sure, Marsha. Uh, Polly is watching from Barnesville, Minnesota. 59 and beautiful, riding tomorrow in my Steve Edwards saddle and tack. Gidget is watching. Hello, 63 and raining here in Texas. Judy is hanging out with us from Gazelle, California, where it is sunny and beautiful. Uh, Edna is watching from Spring Hill, Florida, 78, sunny and warm. Lots of love coming from Edna. Frank is watching from uh, Lincolnton, North Carolina, where currently it is 65 and rainy. I feel like a weatherman. Kathy is watching from a 79 and muggy here in Houston, uh, <laughs> down here. In, no, I'm just kidding. 79 and muggy here in Houston, Texas. Been so busy lately. I missed a few shows. So happy to be here today. Yeah, we sure are glad that you're here as well. And I want to tell you, uh, Kathy, as well as everybody else watching right now, all of these programs, we realize it's fun to watch them live. I have a radio program that I really like watching, and they broadcast the video. And the hosts always say, I don't know who would want to see our faces. But for some reason, it just feels different. I know watching the program live here on YouTube and Facebook it's just it's fun, it's unique, it's just a different experience. But if you want to listen to the program and you don't have YouTube on your phone or you don't want to download video on your phone or you just want the audio, if you go into Spotify or Apple Podcasts and search for Mule Ranch, you will find the audio version of the program there and uh we've got uh we started that after the live version, Steve. And so I've gotten, I'm getting this all caught up. So not only are we releasing the current versions, but we're getting caught up on old versions. So there's three programs that we release every single week on a normal week, three shows that you can watch folks Ooh. as you're going about your business. So Kathy, even if you can't be with us live, uh, you can get the show on replay and on podcast. Scott in South Carolina is watching where it's 61 and rainy. Marsha, nice spring weather today in Virginia. Got my hay in before the transmission in my truck messed up, and I had to wait two hours for the tow truck. Well, glad you got that hay there. First things first, first importance. Bob is watching from eastern Nebraska. Sunny and mild finally. Let's get to our first question from Bob. He says... What are Steve's thoughts on cribbing? And Steve, I don't know what cribbing is, so I'm going to need you to explain that to me first, and then what are your thoughts? Sure. Okay, so what cribbing is, is an animal chewing on wood, and, and uh, it can turn into being a wind sucker, where they actually will take and put their teeth on something and pull back and draw back, and that will make them get like a little high. And, uh, and that's not a good thing because then other animals get it, uh, but by seeing it, think that's going to be fun and they end up doing it. So a cribber is actually a chewer. And here's the problem, folks. You are not going to stop a chewer, a cribber. It's not going to happen. It is natural for them. Why? Because their teeth erupt. In other words, they're constantly growing. Now, they start out to be like this. And as they get older, they get long in a tooth and they get like this, all right? So here's what I can tell you to do. Number one, 
Make sure you keep the teeth floated every year. Don't listen to these knuckleheads that, that say you don't need to have it done. No, every year in the spring, get the teeth floated. That's number one. Why? Because it's good for the di digestive system. Their teeth, they bite with their, their incisors, and then it comes back into the molars, and then they chew it, and then it becomes really fine, and it goes through the intestines. It has to be refined to go through the intestines. And if you want them to carry a bit properly, then you, uh, uh, you, the, the having proper, properly done teeth also has the meal to carry the bit properly. Now, going back to cribbing, what are you doing putting wood in with the mule? You know, listen, folks, they will chew and chew and chew and chew and chew because it makes them feel good. I mean, we talk about that. So if you got wood, here's what I tell you to do. Get rid of it and put in steel. That's the best thing you can do. If you got wood in the meantime, I can tell you those of you that have diesel, uh, uh, diesels where you're changing a diesel oil there on your ranch for any tractors and whatever, you can take diesel fluid uh, and uh, diesel oil and you can brush it on the places where they cribbed. But let me tell you, the best thing to do is just replace it all with steel. You come to my ranch, all you're going to see is steel because otherwise you got maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. So there you are. I hope that answers your question about cribbing. Awesome. Great question. Thanks for sharing on that. Appreciate it. Um, Steve, uh, the next question that we got, uh, this one came in from Nancy. She says, I bought a used cowboy saddle of yours for my mule. So good for you for finding one used. Uh, number one, yeah. they don't become available used very often. And number two, uh, they hold their value real well. So great. I measured my mule. It fits him perfect without the pad. Can I use a thinner pad? My mule is a big boy. Okay. Here's the deal with pads, folks. Uh, especially if you have wool, the best thing you can do is Dave will pull it up and put it on this, uh, put it on where you can see it, but go to my web page and click on pads and see the demonstration that I do with pads. Here's the problem that you all don't think about. I'm sure is that you have to over tighten your cinches to keep the saddle from rolling and moving a lot. Why is that? because pads that are made out of wool or pads that are made out of wool felt or pads that are fake or pads that are, when I say fake, in other words, it looks like wool is kind of a, kind of a, I don't know type, type fabric it is, but anyway, it's kind of fluffy and, uh, and this sort of thing. And all that will make your saddle roll. And so everybody has to do the same thing. They've got to over tighten the cinches to keep it to work. That's why I've designed the pad that I have, all right? The pad that I have, there's the, there's the video there. Now, you all need to be watching this. That's a wool pad right there, okay? And, and watch me, watch when we, when we do this. This is really important. We put the saddle on, okay? And then I have a guy come over, and I'm talking about he wants to keep his wool pad. He said, I won't keep my wool pad. I said, all right, you know, here you go. So you can see the two different ones, and there's, there's the wool. So watch this. Okay, I'm going to hold on to the pad, push on the saddle, and I push it right off. You see that? That's wool. Wool, you have to over-tighten. Now, watch this saddle. Okay, now there it goes. Uh, you see how it slides right off with wool? Nothing sits down. Now... We're going to have this guy who says, I want to keep my wool. And this is my pad. Notice nothing is cinched down. He's pulling on the fender. And look here, that wool pad. I just reached over and just pulled, slipped it right off. He just took both hands and pulled on the fender and could not move that saddle. It's not cinched down, folks. It's just that it has Delcron on it. And Delcron on my saddle pad makes it like, you see that? Nothing cinched down. So Delcron makes it attach and it makes it hold on to the pad so you and you don't have to tighten it so much. Folks, you got to remember everything that I've got here is what I've designed from what I've learned. 
It used to be back in the old days, we just threw a wool blanket on, threw a saddle on and went wham, okay? Now, okay, here's a good one here. <laughs> now, this is Eric, and he's not cinching nothing down. Everybody kept saying, hey, uh, Steve's saddle won't stay in place. Now, you just watched him there. He climbed on and off, and look at this. Back on again on the other side, and he climbs off. Now, watch this. Nothing cinched down, okay? He pulled the cinches all loose. Watch. There's the cinches. No, no cinches are tightened. He took all the cinches loose. There he just climbed on and off the cinches. And then look there. He just pulled the saddle right off. Now, you all just saw him. He climbed on. He climbed off with the cinch down at first and then no cinches at all. Did you see that? Okay, I done that for a reason. When you spend 10, 12 hours in the saddle like I do, I can't get off when I'm moving my cows and tighten up cinches all the time. And when I finally designed the cinch and the pad and the saddle, now I can stay in the saddle. Yes, my cinches get loose, okay? Uh, we've got one, one set of pictures of a big guy. He's 330 pounds. Uh, what is his name? I think we got it in a video or a it's picture. There somewhere. It's Toby, yeah, Toby. And you can see me standing next to him. I mean, he's a big guy, 330 pounds, you know? And I'm, I'm 130. You believe that? You don't believe it, do you, Dave? Okay. No, anyway. you're, yeah, 130 soaking wet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, and you see him climbing right in the saddle, and people tell him all the time, your cinches are too loose. And, and, and he said, Steve, I've met more people just because they said my cinches are too loose. He gave me this one story. He comes riding into this, this uh, camp, and the guy says, sir, sir, your cinches are hanging down way low. And uh, let me follow you over so I can stand on one side and hold the saddle while you climb off. He says, no, you don't have to do that. The saddle will stay in place. Now we're talking 330 pounds. Okay, there you, are. there you are. Look at the size of that man. His arms are bigger around than my thighs. Look at him climbing on and off. Anyway, the guy couldn't believe that he was able to climb on that mule or climb off that mule and that saddle stay in place. You see that, folks? That's 330 pounds right there, right on the, right there, 330 pounds right there. Isn't that amazing? So I didn't, folks, I don't, I don't just have a pad. I got a pad that works. I got a pad that does what it needs to do. And that is keep you from over tightening your cinches. Now, uh, Dave, we got some other questions, I'm sure, but hopefully that helps her out and that gets everybody to see this is not just a pad to be pretty. This is a pad that works. You don't have to make your mule suffer to put your fat little hiney on it. <laughs> yeah, hear that? Uh, by over tightening the cinches. If you get a cinch sore from my saddles, you got the saddle on incorrect. If you get any kind of tack, and we'll talk about it later. We got some pictures, huh, Dave? That's right. Uh, awesome. Great question, Nancy. Appreciate that. Uh, let's hop back over and let's say hello to Cowboy Ken, 73 degrees in sunny Connecticut, Hannah, Dunnell in Georgia, Florida, 80 degrees, gorgeous. God bless America. David Pingelli, 65, cloudy, but great day here in Manchester, Georgia. Welcome home. Y'all go get Come Along Coffee. Mule Ranch, just search Mule Ranch, come along coffee, order it now. This is your friendly reminder. Carla is watching from British Columbia, which makes it international. Sunny, cool today, crazy winds, but never too cool to play mule games. That's right. Yeah, Santa loves some mule girl. games. Rory wow. is watching from Southwest Ohio, cloudy and warm. Joyce is watching spring. Crocuses are blooming. What is a crocus? I've never heard of a crocus. Crocuses? Crocuses. crocuses. Crocus. I'm going to have to look that up. All right. Learning new things here. Education. Uh, Judy is watching. I have a hoof trimming issue with my yearling mule. Her fronts turn out. Her hinds turn out. 
I've been having her trimmed regularly, but things are not improving. The farrier states she has really hard, healthy feet. Farrier trims the outside heel shorter. It does not change the lineup. Does she need to trim the toe more? Heels are low. Toes seem slightly long. I do not trim her myself because she is spunky. I want a farrier to trim her so I can correct the with the come-along rope. When she moves around, she usually settles down. Maybe I need a different farrier. Great question. Good details. Uh, Steve, what type of uh, encouragement do you have for Judy? Okay, so we got a yearling colt, and the feet are starting to turn out. So you're saying they're what we call pigeon toed. Is that right? Okay, if that's what you want. Okay. Now, if she if he trims the outside, okay, that won't work. It has to be trimmed on the inside. No, that on the inside. Out, outside's correct. Then that will bring it around. So he may end up having to do more to correct it because you got roughly about till it's three years old before the legs are completely the way they're going to be. Uh, it's difficult to find anyone that knows much about corrective shoeing. And if the feet are turning out right now as a yearling, you better get after it. So that means your vet, your, your shoer is going to have to take off more. So and it's, it's not that hard to do y'all. You take that rasp and just go ahead and take off more. Cause when you come down on the outside, that's going to turn the feet in so it'll be straight. Okay. So, uh, yeah, get after it. And, and you, you're going to have to tell your failure, be more aggressive at it. Okay. Because if you don't see any changes by the time he's a year and a half, you've not done enough. Awesome. Next question. This one came in from Randy while you were out of town and now you may have spoken with him yet, but I wanted to go ahead and ask the question anyways. He says, I've got a pretty small mule that might need a five and a half inch bit. Measuring his mouth comes in at about four two five. I know that the trail riding bit is available in five and five and a half. Is it available any smaller or something not to worry about and just use the five? He has done very well with the mule riders martingale and seems ready to start the transition. Uh, what would you say there for Randy? Okay, now remember, folks, we're talking about mules. They have a fatter lip. They have a different jaw set some, uh, uh, system and this sort of thing. So if you if you measure out five and a, four and a half inches, put a five inch in there. Now you got to remember, the Mule Riders Martingale is a six inch bit, but it's also a snaffle bit, snaffle bit. So that means it's going to get narrower and wider depending on how you use it. So it's good. I've used that Mule Riders Martingale for almost 30 years now on everything you can imagine from a, from a Pertron mule to a, to a pony mule. And it, and it works wonderful. So let's go back. Uh, if it measures out four and a half inches, put the five in it. Good. Cause think about it. A half an inch is two quarters. So you can put your finger in each side. You're good. You don't want it set and flush against the animal's face. You will create strawberry patches and it could even get a strawberry patch even when uh, it's wider because they usually will brace on it. So you, you should be just fine uh, with your five inch bit. Wonderful. Uh, he had a follow up unrelated, he says. Um, did I hear you say somewhere that you don't halter or tie your mules when they are trailered? Did I dream that up or is that accurate? No, that's, ac that's accurate. We'll, we'll take and we'll jump them in the trailer with our, our, our uh, come along hitch. We'll jump them in the trailer and we'll cue them to stand. We'll pull the come along hitch off and then we'll walk out and they will, we'll tie our bridle to the, to the horn of the saddle and tie it back. And then depending on how many we have, if there's just a couple in the trailer, remember we usually have a 28 foot stock trailer. All right. So depending on how many is in the trailer, uh, we'll just let them find their sp spot in there and they'll just stand there and be quiet, which kind of reminds me, um, Oh, what's his name? You just mentioned him. The first couple guys this morning, the, 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 uh, taxidermist, uh, Sherman, um, Sherman, he sent me some pictures. Uh, I don't, I, I, I got him. I didn't, I don't think I sent them to you, but of Sherman, uh, and, and he's mule standing still with the come along hitch on 
and it, and it works. He said, man, Steve, it works. Is that right, Sherman? Sherman's watching. I know he's going to get back to us. While we're waiting yeah. for that, got a question from Christopher. Says, I know you say never buy a mule that the previous owner didn't use one, uh, but is this for everywhere? I live in the flatlands. 98% of the people don't. Oh, Britchen. This was in Britchen. I know you say never buy a mule where the previous owner didn't use a Britchen, but is this for everywhere? I live in the flatlands. 98% of the people don't use a britchin around here. I will always use one because I ride all over the USA. I'm looking for a new mule, but everyone around here doesn't use these. And I know you say don't buy them. Is it for mountain areas only? This is a great question, Christopher. I'm really grateful that you ask it. Uh, primarily because three years ago, we talked a lot about this. We mentioned it here or there, but we haven't talked about it as much. Steve, Talk to us about the britchen, and is it just for mountain range, and we don't need it on flatlands, or is that is that wrong thinking? We should have some of that video footage of when I did the clinic here, where I was showing that even on flat ground, without a breaching, within minutes, the saddle is sitting on top of the scapula. Now, go back. When all these people that aren't riding, uh, that you've seen riding around, and they've been riding their mules, I want you to notice where the saddle is. Notice the saddle is sitting on top of the scapula. Notice the front cinch is up underneath the front legs. So, you know, they may be riding without the breaching, but their mule is paying the price. Folks, you can watch them. Go out. Everybody, everybody, when you ride these trail riders and these people say they don't need a breaching, look and see. You'll see it. You, it'll stand right out. The cinch is right underneath the front leg and the saddle sitting on top of the scapula and they're crippling their mule, okay? Now, here's one of the problems. It's going to be next to impossible to try to find um, a, a, a mule that has been riding a bridge in most of its life because, unfortunately, we have a lot of horse people and they don't have any knowledge of mules other than the few little mules they've worked with, which reminds me, I was talking with somebody yesterday in Tennessee and they were at Murfreesboro and they said some guy who said he was a mule man said he, he rode with a crouper on flat ground and a bridge on my on mountains and he put a crouper on this one mule and the mule went to hopping around you know uh you all got to remember that tail is hooked to bone there's no mass okay and it does not keep the saddle into place you remember your saddle can move an inch and a half forward and back, left and right. It can move an inch and a half. With a crouper, it can move, it'll move almost three inches. And in a short time, be right on top of scapula. Remember folks, look at your, at your saddle. If the front cinch is one hand away from the front leg, then that tells you that the saddle should be back an inch and a half behind the scapula. And Notice your front cinch. It's always at an angle. Okay. What happens when it's at an angle? When it's at an angle, it's going to pull the saddle forward. And you ain't going to change it because it's the way the mule's hourglass belly that they have. And so, therefore, that front cinch is at an angle. Why do I tell you don't over tighten the front cinch? Because when you over tighten it, number one, you're going to have a lot of dry spots in that area because you are, you, are, you are shortening the stride of that scapula. But number two, when you over tighten that front cinch, it's gonna pull the saddle forward. You see, that's what that does. There's a saddle like this, it's at an angle and it pulls the saddle forward. The back cinch is straight up and down. And then you want to have your, your hobble strap between your front cinch and your rear cinch. You want it to be four to six inches depending on the 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 length of your mule if you've got a short strided mule or a long strided mule then you're going to have to adjust it accordingly okay now all these measurements are general measurements so that it give you a place to start where to adjust to because it's going to take you time okay and and i can tell you that that uh, like this this guy who said he was a, a mule trainer all he is is a horse trainer in a mule costume because then he would know better. Now, he did say one thing right. It's what they told me. He said, I always had the back cinch tight, front cinch loose. Well, I know this guy. He's been to my clinics, okay? 
and I've watched him train. And so I know who he, I know who he is. And I know that his program is mostly horse training in a mule costume. Okay. So folks don't listen to that. You know, I can tell you truthfully that I know of several people who have had their animals had to put them down because the crouper broke their back because of the spine. And when, what happens is this, okay. Now underneath the tail, that's the softest place on that mule's body besides his nose. Rub it underneath there sometime. You'll see soft. When it gets rubbed by that crouper, then what do we do? We loosen up the crouper. What does that do? Now the crouper is here. Okay. Is here, right? And then if we loosen it up, now we go up to here and we loosen up. Now we got the cantilever when the saddle goes forward and that's how it breaks the back of the spine. That's what it does. Okay. Now you all can find out on your own, but I can't, I can tell you that I got story after story of people who have actually had to put their animals down because they were darn croupers. So don't do a crouper. Richard all the time. Uh, one of the things in the mule saddle training course, I'll put a link in the comment section here in a second. When you watch those videos, and by the way, they're all free. When you watch those videos, what you're going to find is that one of the videos in particular is about 26 minutes long. And Steve goes through, puts on the saddle, adjusts the cinches, adjusts the britchin, adjusts the breast collar, walks the animal around and immediately has to make more adjustments because the saddle winds up having some give. And what is it? You want a inch and a half in the front, inch and a half in the back? No, you want an inch and a half from the scapula to the, to the concho on the saddle to the edge, okay? And then by having that inch and a half come straight down to a cinch, you should have four inches from the front leg to the front cinch. You should be able to put your hand right up there. If that cinch is too far forward, it's gonna bring the saddle forward. And also, if that saddle creeps forward, you got your front cinch too tight. And folks, that's why I've designed the cinches that I have. It has elastic on the inside. You see, and when you over pull on those cinches to over tighten them, guess what? There's a cover and then that cinch where you're, where you put in the D ring is going to pull up past that cover. And if you go past the cover, you over tighten your saddle. It's easy. I designed it that way. So that you will know when you over tighten, just, just look at my cinches. And when you pull up on them, pull up on that D ring, and you tighten it up. If it goes past the cover, it's over tight. But Steve, it feels too loose. Well, you're going to have to learn how to climb in that saddle the right way. What's the right way? Left hand on the on the mane, right hand on the horn, climb in the saddle. Okay, that's what Eric did when you see him climb in there without any cinches tight or anything. All right. Next question. This one comes in from uh, Susie and says. I bought a donkey that's really skinny. What can I feed it besides Bermuda grass? Okay. We, one thing we always have to be concerned about is carbohydrates when it comes to donkeys. Because they can really develop uh, uh, fat pockets on the neck, top of the ribs, around the dock of the tail. The downside of that, that's called grass founder. And it can go into the feet. And you could have a crippled donkey because they're very, they're, they're very susceptible to a, kind of like a, a diabetic situation, okay, from too many carbs in the hay. Now, you can have Bermuda hay and, and have it cut the right time of the year and have it stronger than, like say, your first cuttings are always stronger than your third cuttings, depending on what part of the country you're in is to get your cuttings. So uh, what can you feed them? Number one, you can do their teeth. Make sure their teeth are floated. That's number one. Always, folks, always. Every year, every spring, teeth floated. You all should all be thinking about teeth floating right now. Next thing you do is, is your ivermectin, your, your paste warmer, okay? Uh, worm them every year, every year, okay? And get that done. The next thing you should do to put weight on that donkey 
is uh, is this a riding donkey or how big is this donkey? So, yeah, so that it was a comment that came through uh, on one of our other videos. So we don't know, but what I did was I uh, gave her a link to this, and then I sent her a link to Mules Can't Stand Prosperity as well, which there's a sign up for the uh, Mule Feed Talk program there. So hopefully that'll get you going, Susie. And uh, sure hope that uh, sure hope that you'll come back and give us a uh, give us an update. Would love to just know how things are going there. Okay, next question. This one comes from Julie. Says I have an in I have inherited a grouchy mule. Where can I get info on how to reform and retrain her? I'm unable to halt her and pet her now, but lots of work ahead. I've heard. Not like training a horse. She supposedly hates men, but my son has been spending time with her. And now she lets him pet her. I think she has potential help. <laughs> okay. Disposition, folks, is disposition. When you're buying a meal, you're buying a donkey, you buy disposition. If she's grouchy, you can't train disposition out. You cannot change it. Can you train it so that she will listen to you? Yes. Okay. Can you do that work? Yes. This stuff of... He hates men or hates women. I've had this time and time again where people have said that. And I had one lady, I've had a lot of ladies tell me this. Well, I don't know how you're going to do it because this mule don't like men. Well, a few minutes later, by the time I had worked with this mule with the come along hitch, this, this mule didn't want nothing to do with that woman. <laughs> and I don't know what the deal is there. But anyway, so don't, don't listen to that. So here's, here's what you do. Always start number one. Put them in a 20 by 20 stall. Number two, feed them according to your training program. Okay. Number three, always use, start the groundwork. Groundwork, 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 groundwork. Put the come along hitch on, follow the video, do your groundwork. There's nothing, folks, you cannot overdo. You can't do enough of groundwork. That's extremely, extremely, extremely important. All right, Steve, here you go. This, These are crocuses. Whoa, those are pretty. Very wow. pretty. Gorgeous, wow. huh? Crocus. Now, I knew I heard of a crocus. Crocuses oh. are in full bloom, she says. So very, very Whoa. cool. Thank you, Joyce. Appreciate you letting us know. Um, all right, here. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's go back through. Mark Miller watching from South Carolina. Uh, Marsha's watching. Rory says, ha ha, 130 my ass. So I guess he's talking about his donkey. Uh, 630, because you said 130, Steve. <laughs> 130 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he's yeah. talking about his donkey there. Jim, 63 sure. degrees, light rain. Watching from Alabama. Ma Maggie's watching from North Carolina. Sharon says, would you suggest locking my five-month mule up as finally his mom is going next week or letting him get his frustration out in the paddock? Uh, no, I, you know, definitely keep them where they're going to be safe, okay? They're going to be running and playing and looking for mama, and, and it's going to drive you crazy. It's going to be tough. Some of these mules, especially a, a John mule, they just holler for mama. So get him gelded right away. Okay. But hey, whatever works the best for you, uh, you cannot put them, lock them completely out where they don't see any sunshine. You know, that's not going to help. And it's not going to help to turn them out in a 40 foot pasture. Okay. You just have to find what's going to work best for you. The best thing to do is keep the donkey or keep the mule safe. Next question. This one comes from Phyllis. She's watching. She has a 15-year-old molly mule that's been turned out and fed and loved on. She now wants to get in my space bad. Wall one and drag wall one and drag me around doing what she wants to do. She also is a very impatient uh, animal when tied. She frets and paws. Will the come along halter maybe teach her not to drag and get in my space? I'm a little scared of her thinking she may turn mean. I have not done a lot with her, but the worst thing she has done is try to nip me when I'm untying to turn out. They told me some do that when they're impatient. So good question here from Phyllis. Steve, what would you say? Yeah, the come along rope is definitely going to do what you need to do. It's not a halter. It's a training device. It's a way to keep them 
uh, thinking correctly all the time because it communicates to their nose, underneath the chin and behind the pole. So it's a wonderful tool for that. If she's nipping at you, then she's telling you not you're not going fast enough to let her out into the paddock. Well, then guess what? You need to take and, and do it your way, not her way. Put the come long hitch on her. Always turn them around inside the pen and always point toward the gate. Don't just be going out and there's your paddock out there and you turn them loose and they run. They'll, they'll kick up and hurt you. Okay. Always go through the gate, turn them around, face the gate, pull the halter off, pull the come along hitch off. You go out first, they go out second. So that means it's going to take some time on your part. Because one of the downsides is this. Folks just take off the halter and then just watch them run off. Okay. Don't do that. You leave first. The mule leaves second. That way you stay in control. All right there. Um, let's see here. Next question comes from John. He says, I have an attitude of grat gratitude for who you are and all that you, sh you share. Do you happen to have a mule named Festus, like on Gunsmoke? You ever have a fuel mule named Festus, John? Or <laughs> Festus, Steve? No, I, I never have. I've trained a few Festus over the years, but I've never, never had one. There you go, John. Thanks for asking. Appreciate it. And uh, if you know of a mule named Festus that you think we should get to know, John, uh, let us know. Send pics. We'd be happy to take a look. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, here. Uh, Dave O'Brien says, Steve, I can vouch for your saddle pad. I use it on my horse with a loose cinch. He loves it and the pad stays put. So we love hearing that. Uh, yeah, and lots of folks have heard uh, or have shared that they've used the saddle pad on the horses. Uh, and we say, hey, if it works for you, go for it. Uh, but just a, a word, do not use the mule, Steve's uh, saddles on anything but a mule. Do not use Steve's saddles on a horse. And the reason is the same reason why you would not use a uh, standard horse saddle on a mule. Uh, it's a different animal, different needs, different bone structure, and uh, you want you want both of them to be happy, so just give them the different needs that they got. Uh, let's see here. Greetings from Washington, 59 degrees and windy. Jody, Larry, and Rocky are watching. All right. Thanks for keeping Jody and Larry in, in line, Rocky. Uh, John Sherman says, yes, sir, that come along hitch works wonders. I don't use a rope halter very much. That come along hitch is like grandma's switch. It gets your attention. John Sherman is old school. Yeah, boy. Old school, which unfortunately it's old school. I think it should be the new school, but hey, that's not what we're here to talk about. Yeah, Steve, um, talk a little bit about this. Now, Steve, you and I have been working together for, I, I don't know, 17 years, 20 years, something like that. And we talked a lot more about the rope halter uh, a, a long time ago, but you have uh, shifted in the amount that you're talking about the rope halter versus the come along rope. Do you want to share a little bit about that and uh, why the come along rope has really gained a lot of your attention and what you share with people? Well, you know, I've always used it for training, but I've also just used it to go and get my animal. And since most folks didn't really understand the come along hitch and me trying to explain it, I would just tell them to adjust the rope halter and then, you know, go ahead and use it. Well, the downside was then people started having more problems. And just like my saddle, uh, I started saying, oh, wait a minute, why, why do I have to look like everybody else? Why don't I just show folks exactly what I do? Okay exactly what I do, not just, okay, this will make you uh, do okay. I want you to do your best. And you can't do it with a rope halter. You know, even though it's adjusted and this sort of thing, it is part two of my, of my training program. And, and I rarely would put a halter on a mule, uh, rarely. And, and it's for a, a variety of different things. Most of the time it's the come along hitch. I put it on and you can see it in a lot of my videos and this sort of thing and go from there. The reason I did it originally, Dave, is because it made it a little easier on people. But the problem is people started getting the mule skiers, the mules moving around, and they were not getting the full communication value out of the halter 
like they do the come along hitch. And around the ranch, that's all I used was the come along hitch. So I thought, well, why not just tell folks they got a cowboy up, you know, use that come along hitch, use it exclusively, and you will have an awesome mule all the way through. Um, so that's, that's the reason right there, Dave. Does that make sense to you? One of the things that I'll throw in um, that I've noticed is, is the come along rope itself with the come along hitch. Um, that is the tool. But what I've noticed in watching you train, Steve, not only in seeing you train, but watching you observe other people, is the tool is just half of the equation. The other half of the equation, and maybe you'd have some other things to throw in here, but really winds up being your timing in communicating yeah. with the animal what you're wanting to communicate. And the idea here became very clear to me at one of your clinics. We had an animal that, that kept wanting to get into the space of the handler. And the clinic was over, the clinic was done, and we were talking, but the handler was still uh, holding on to the come-along rope, and the animal kept trying to get into her space. And I saw right then, I was like, this animal is learning right now. Even though training is done, training is actually not done at all. This animal is learning right now that I can get into my handler's space, and she's not going to do anything about it. And I was a little bold. Uh, cause I've never really corrected anyone, but I saw it. I was a little bold. I said, Hey, I want to let you know that your animal, your mule right now is learning that it's okay to get into your space. You need to immediately, the second you feel that animal move its head to get into your space, you need to yank on the rope and get them to get them to step back because you're teaching them right now that this is okay. And so half of the equation is the come along rope. You can't just put it on there, Steve, and, uh, it's going to do miracles. It's, installing it, but then it's also right. knowing the correct ground foundation work to do and the timing with it. So I think that's an important thing. So folks don't get the come along rope, put it on and then just start tugging on the animal. It's, it's about the timing and it's about really the bump, bump, bump. It's, it's, you know, they're going to, they're going to, they'll pull you all day long if you want to tug with them. But if you're going to bump, 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 then, then you've got some leverage. Did I explain all that correct, Steve? You, you did awesome, man. Hey, yeah, hey, hey. You did awesome. Yeah. I'm learning stuff here. Uh, JR sent in a message, says, I've owned this mule now all winter and she doesn't want to get caught. Sounds like some girls that I wanted to date in high school. She is buddy sour. I finally got her in a small lot and she jumped out and ruined the gate. I am at my wits end. She is kind of touchy on the ground, but seems to ride good. I need help or I need to sell her. And this is the reason why we do this program. You should enjoy owning a mule. You should enjoy the process. You should feel like when you step out there to train, uh, you have some insights into commanding the mind of this animal. So thank you, JR, for messaging. Yeah, Steve, it. what would you say to JR? Leave it. Good boy. Hey, I'm sorry, Dave. My, my wife just pulled up and my dog just told me that she was there. Okay. So let's go back. Um, so the, the, the meal needs to be in a small pen, 20 by 20. All right, Jess, leave it. Uh, he needs to be in a 20 by 20 stall needs to be, uh, I, 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 it's hard to understand, but folks do just like you said, she rides good, but no good on the ground. What I'd like you all to do that one that has rides good, but not very good on the ground. I want you to go out and have your brake fluid taken out of your brakes so you got no brakes. And then I want you to go down the road. Now, what do you think? You're going to go down the road, but when you really need to stop, you can't do it, can you? Oh, the car rides good going down the road, uh, but you can't stop. Okay. So what am I, what am I saying? Am I saying, don't, what are you doing in the saddle? Why not fix that problem? Because you see, right now you're doing okay. But one day when this mule decides to grab his butt and take off, you ain't gonna stop him. He'll jump over top of a of a gate without you on him. He'll jump off him, jump over it with you on him. Okay? I'll guarantee you will. Folks, fix it on the ground. Do your ground work first. Put that mule in a 20 by 20 stall, put an electric wire all the way around. So when that mule goes up to touch or look, he's going to get a zip. Okay. He's going to get a zip. 
and that'll tell him he better stay in one spot, a 20 by 20 stall. That's what he needs to be. All of you, all of you, you know, you don't need to have a mountain, a great big pasture or paddock. If you're training and you're getting this mule ready for the, for the summer, the summer rides, you need to be in a small pen and you need to start getting their mindset now. And a 20 by 20 stall will set a good mindset. Awesome. Very good. Okay, here. Uh, let's see. Marsha says, do you ever see the nylon breaching some companies have put out for horses in their English saddle? I, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, any thoughts on nylon breaching uh, now, related the to the English saddle? The problem with nylon, Dave, I'm sorry. The problem with nylon is it's too light and it's going to creep up the, the, the body. You need on your breaching plate, it needs to be heavy so that it hangs down. Nylon, you'll constantly be creeping up the, the rump. And believe me, I've tried the nylon. I tried to do it with my pack mules and stuff. I was trying to get as light as possible, be as strong as possible. Then when I got into the beta, bang, okay? It really worked good. The downside of English riders is you only have a front cinch. And the saddle depends upon that front cinch. You need to have a saddle with a rear cinch on it and attaching the breaching, a good quality breaching to it. Now I can tell you that just over the years, Dave, and just here, just recently, I had a lady that uh, she she wanted a, a, a breaching in black and she wanted my breaching. And I said, well, you know, my saddle maker really doesn't make them in black. It takes quite a bit to just make one by itself. Because when we do, we do, we do a lot of breachings at one time. And so she went ahead and got a breaching from another company. Well, in the meantime, my saddle maker said, hey, I'll go ahead and make her one, Steve. Just let her know. So it happened to be just right. I contacted her and said, hey, I've got the, uh, my saddle maker will make you a breaching. She says, good, because this breaching is not working out. It's, it's soaring my mule, and I really got problems. You see, folks, there's a big difference between this tack. You got to remember, I've got over 50 years of trying to figure out how to best have my mule comfortable. And this breaching is one good example. All right. Um, okay. Oh, just lost my screen there. Okay. Now we got it back. Carmen is watching, says, I've been talking with Steve about my 50 year old mule and the sliding gag hacks more gag hack a more bit. She does not neck rein good to the right, but reins fine to the left. Will your trail riding bit, be good to transition her to that. No, I, I I told her, no, she needs to go to the mule riders, Martin Gale, which sets the head and stuff. Now listen to what she's saying, folks. He'll turn good to the left, but won't go to the right. Well, it's running through his shoulder. Well, why is that? Well, if you see, seen what I've seen, I've seen her riding this mule, seen the picture. She only has a front cinch and a saddle sitting on top of scapula. So guess what? The mule don't want to turn to that to that right because it's saddle it's the saddle is bumping the scapula and it's making it sore so if you pull it to the right even more then it's going to make that mule even more sore than what it is and i've explained that to her in this sort of thing a uh, sliding gag bit folks is is a horrible tool uh you want to stay completely away from them you want to you want to try to get lighter folks not heavier so you can't go with a nose piece and a bit and a chain on, on and a uh, curb chain that ends up creating a big mess and you end up having an unhappy mule. Uh, next question. This one came from Christopher says um, I'm left-handed and all I have all my life. I got on my horses on the right side. People look at me funny. What's your take on left-handed people uh, doing the work opposite of most people when do, dealing with mules? I, I say fine, good for you. You know, I like to get on and off both sides. When I saddle, I usually start from the right hand side when I saddle, simply because that's where my cinches are. So once I throw my saddle up, I lay my cinches down straight. I come around, I bring my breaching down, and I come on around and then I do my cinches. So climbing on and off either side, good for you. Awesome. Uh, so we had a question earlier from uh, Susie, and she's got another one here. I got a new mammoth five-year green donkey. Very sweet, picks up feet, leads well with the halter. Stand still. Do I need the come-along hitch? 
Absolutely, folks. What we have to understand is right now the donkey's doing okay. There's no stressful things happen. But all of a sudden, let's just say a yapping dog jumps out and goes to yapping at. She's not going to have control with that rope halter. She's going to be dragged. Yes, yes, use the come along hitch. The come along hitch refines your communication between your hands and the donkey's nose. And you don't get that refinement with the rope halter. And you especially don't get it with a nylon halter. All right. This one might be fun. Steve, were you around Apache Junction in the 1960s when they held the Burrow Derby? That was a real wake-up call for the dudes that had to catch a wild donkey and lead them on a 50-mile race route. Most of the runners wound up, peeled up, and frazzled. It made donkey basketball look like knitting bee. My sis was the first Burrow Derby queen. Steve, do you know about the Burrow Derby? I knew about it. I never did see it. It's, it's fun. Uh, we have something similar to that here in Superior, Arizona. Uh, where they actually have kind of a, a rekindling of the, of the borough derby, but people have their own boroughs. And there's sometimes, and there's some people there that lease them out to for people to do it. But yeah, we got a borough derby up here in Superior uh, during January. How fun. Uh, Herschel is watching, 67 and not much wind. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jacob, hello from Minnesota. Thank you guys for all this information. I really appreciate it. Gidget says, I agree. The come along hitch and no more grass has done a lot for my mule. And Steve, that's it. That's everything for this week. Uh, we got my through goodness. all the questions. Uh, we got through, uh, I think we got through all of our answers. Yeah. I don't think we have anything hanging out there. Anything you want to say before we're all done this week, Steve? Well, we've got a couple pictures of some uh of a mule with some hair rubbed off that I sent you there. Do you still have those? Yeah. Yeah. I'll bring them up here. Give me, give me a second here. What are we about to look at? Okay. One of the things I want to tell you folks is that even if you have my tack, if it's adjusted incorrectly, it will wear hair folks. When you're seeing hair being weared off, especially winter hair, winter hair comes off easier than summer hair. All right. And I want you to see the side of the view of this mule with his britching. And I want you to see a couple of places where the, the uh, hair is rubbed clean off from the breast collar. So I want to show you why the person's having the problem. And he's learning. He's a, he's a firefighter in uh, Colorado. He knows a couple of buddies of mine that are firefighters there in Colorado. Okay, now, uh, oh, yeah. Do you see the two places there on the right and left side? Oh, no, that's the front leg, the front leg. You see how the hairs wore off in the front leg? Okay, that is because he had the, the britching incorrectly adjusted, which you'll see here in a minute. And then that saddle went forward and the cinch went forward. And every time the mule run his leg against it, it rubbed the hair off. Okay, now, you, I, I, now here's, the, here's the saddle. Do you notice the breaching? Notice how the quarter strap doesn't go, doesn't stay straight alongside and go to the D-ring. You see how it goes up and then down? That's misadjusted. And so what happens is, and it's too low, so it allowed the saddle to go forward and then into the front leg. So you see that, that quarter strap is really, really important. So I would adjust the breaching up about two notches and make sure that your quarter straps on the side are straight. Okay, you see how he's pulling away from the side, pull straight back. You see how the hair is wore off in one place? That's because the breaching is straight. It's not at an angle with the hip. Anytime your breaching is, is razor blading the hair off just to one spot, the breaching is too straight. It needs to be at an angle with the hip. And you see here, he's got the breast collar adjusted correctly. Notice how the breast collar adjusted correctly, how it's in the middle of his chest. And you can see the, the hair rubbed off of right and left. See how the hair is rubbed off right and left? So he had his breast collar too loose. So see, even with my gear, folks, you can pull hair because it's misadjusted. Now, here's what they used to do. The old mule skinners, 
used to take urine, keep a can of urine around, and they would splash it on these places to toughen it up. Kind of nasty. I use Listerine mouthwash. It does a good job of toughening that stuff up. So that's all from me, Dave. I'm done. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us today. Really appreciate it. It was good to spend a little bit of time with you. I want to remind you uh, that you all can uh, subscribe to the podcast. That's right. You can download past episodes, uh, which all of this is evergreen content. Uh, Every now and again, I guess we say the word Christmas. Uh, In 2020, I think we said COVID, Trump. um, Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that every now and again, but all the questions are evergreen. It's all good. And who doesn't want to go back to 2020 and hear us talk about that? No, no, no. So all of the old episodes are up there. Every week we're releasing a couple plus the latest episode, which is today. So you can go and download them. I put a link in the comment section. Go subscribe. And if you do listen on Apple or Spotify, would you please leave a review for us. Uh, that'll make sure that when people search Mule Podcast, this one pops to the top. And uh, it's okay if they find other ones. We just want them to find this one first. Thanks so much for spending time. God bless. MuleRanch.com. All sorts of free stuff. And we will see you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Hey, Dave. Hold on, Dave. Hold on just a minute. Oh, what is it? I want to mention one thing. Yeah. I'm going to start talking about this. Yeah. Shelbyville, the end of September... That is the Mule Days and Bluegrass Festival there in Shelbyville. I talked to Marty Ray yesterday, and he's getting excited about doing this 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 show there. So you all prepare yourself, Dave. Hey, Dave from Texas. Remember that nice meal you got? And he's got a better one this year. He said this new meal is awesome. Now listen to that, Pin Galley. There's a yearly meal coming up in Shelbyville. It's going to be awesome. All right, y'all get ready for Shelbyville. It's five, six months away, but it's the only clinic I do every year. Hey, there you go. Links in the comment section. God bless everyone. Take care. (laughs) 